Okay, we should be recording now. And I'll go through this quick. We've already discussed this, so I'll just show you the slides. So especially for those who weren't here for the for that lecture. And this is recorded, so hopefully this will be on Moodle as well. Right. So we'll talk about communication. So I'll just fly through it because we've already spent enough time on this. Communication, as it started in the old days, it has all mostly been either one-to-one -one or many-to-many. -many. So <clears throat> nowadays, there's a lot of communication happening and it needs a lot of protocols. So first, So any devices that communicate, they can say we can classify it into either of those two. But there are many ways to classify communication. This is just one of them. Our communication can either be point to point or multi point. I mean, the point to point is when two parties or two individuals or two devices, and there's a link between them and they talk one-to-one. One. The multi-point is where the link is shared by many other devices. What we see here in both examples here, they're both point-to-point. Point. It can be wireless, it can be a network, but every link here only carries the communication of the two devices on either side. So for example here, if link machine one wants to talk to machine two, they must have a link. Machine one cannot send to a message to machine number two through other devices. So if you can only send a message directly to one device, if you have a direct link with that device, we call that point to point. So if you asked, what's a point to point link? The easiest way to say it's one channel, they communicate. And this channel is dedicated to those two devices. <clears throat> There's no sharing here. You don't share your link with other, other devices communication. The multi-point is where the, the, sh the channel is shared for the communication of other devices. Again, it can be wire or wireless. Here's an example. The bus topology is just an example. That maybe if machine A wants to send a message to machine B, this message will go from A to every device. It will go all the way from this end of the wire or the channel or the cable to this end and it'll go to every device it's basically in this example it's broadcasted now if machine b wants to send a message to machine well if machine d wants to send a message to machine e it has to wait for a to finish transmission before it starts transmission in those shared channels the multi-point communication if two machines transmit at the same time there'll be something we call collision. And what we mean by collision, we don't mean actual collision in communication, data or electricity or signals, but it, we mean that two are talking or more are talking at the same time and the listeners cannot really understand, make out what anyone is saying. So we call that collision. And that's one disadvantage of multi-point. Collisions don't happen in the point to point, these ones here. Only two can transmit. They, even if they transmit simultaneously, they transmit at different frequencies. But here, everybody must transmit at the same frequency so everybody can hear everything. They don't have to change. The listeners don't need to change frequencies. So, which one is better? One reason is this better? Yeah. Multi point or the point to point, which one do you think is better? Again, you should know most of this stuff. Good answer, That's the wrong answer. Which one is better, point to point or multi point? He said, and it's the wrong answer. What do you think? Multi point, did you say? Point to point, everybody insists. What do you think? I know you know the answer. Hold on. 
Which one is better, point to point or multi point? It depends what you want, right? And here are the key words that you need to figure out. Let me go to cost. Which one is better? Now, if you're in a company and they say to you, oh, we have 100 computers, can we connect them point to point or multi point? Don't say point to point and don't say multi point. Guys, from now on, never, never go for any choice. Anytime you're asked, don't say this is better than that. In technology, there isn't one way better than the other, except with a reason. Unless you say, well, this one is better because it's, you know, faster or it's because it's. So now, who, who was answering? I think it was you. Oh, no, I think it was you. Give me one reason why you might say this one is better than that. Here are the reasons there. But tell me which one. Multi point is better because of. Keep going, keep going. I'm saving you. Multi point is better because of liquid. Yeah, consider this. Consider this. Because of the cost. Yeah. Which one? Okay, so we want the more expensive one. Is the more expensive one the better? No. No, all right. So the cheaper one. Which one of these would be cheaper to connect your computers in? The the multi point. Why? Uh, it's, 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 it, it has a less cost and. Uh, Why does it have less cost? It has not cost. It has many computers, and uh, it, it can be. Well, you, we already have the same number of computers. We have fifty computers in this room. Shall we connect them in multi point or point to point? Don't cut. Don't count the cost of the actual. Only connections. Now we want to connect them in a network. So which one is cheaper? Is this in a single uh, dedicated line? Uh, That's cool. I'm not looking for dedication. Which one is better, cheaper? Yeah, because, exactly. So point to point, you will need a lot of cables and you have to pay for them. This one will use a lot less cables. And that's the only thing. You have, we already have the computers. Now we're going to buy the cables. You have to buy cables from point to point. It's going to be very expensive. Now, speed. Which one would be faster? Point to point. Why? Because uh, it uses dedicated lines or links. So every answer you need to have the good, the proper reason behind it. But you keep going like this, and your decisions will be right. A robustness. First, what's a robust system? Then that could come to you. I mean, even if it said something like, oh, did you do the course before? Yeah. What did you, did you hear me <laughs> last? Diploma. Okay, last week. Huh? Higher diploma. Oh, okay. You remember. Okay, good. Good to know. Now, you want to tell us which one is more robust? This one or that one? Anybody want to take it? Yeah? I see your hand up, no? Which, which one is more robust? Point to point is more robust. Why? Imagine if a link breaks, what happens in either case? If a link breaks here, yeah, what happens? If this broken? The system, no, the machine three will not be able to communicate with machine two, but everybody else will continue communicating. That's a robust system. That even parts of it breaks, the rest will continue to work. Why don't you come and sit here beside me? Yeah, you're too far out there. I can't. I keep going up and down there. I'm going to lose all the weight I have. Thank you. No, you were putting your hand up. Yeah. Why, why, why is the multi-point is not robust? With the point-to-point, -point, you have single point of failure. With multi-point, you don't have. No, yeah, okay, thank you. You're thinking of another reason. No, we are just talking about robustness. You know what robustness is? Yeah. So one it doesn't affect everything else. If, if there's a failure in the system, it doesn't affect. If there is one breaking, breakage or failure in a system, it, the whole system doesn't stop working. 
So we know now in the point to point, if one link breaks, okay, those two machines will not be able to communicate, but the rest of the network will continue communicating. But in the multi point, what happens? If they can't forward information to the other ones. Okay. So if there's a single point? Right. In the multi point, generally, guys, if you consider all this is one electric circuit that's going around, around all the machines, and if any, is any breakage or opening in that circuit, all communicate communication stops. Uh, so, so it's as you said, single point failure, but one breakage will will cause the entire thing to stop. So it's not robust. Okay. What's the next one? Scalability. What's scalability? Anybody know what scalability is? What do we mean by scalable? Changing the size, they can bigger or smaller, scalable. Right, so in this case, growing. The network, guys, if you are asked to install a network in an office or a company, and they ask, they tell you we need exactly 20, by the end of the year, be certain, they're gonna be 40 or 60, they're gonna grow. That's scalability, that's increase in size. So, which one would be more suitable in your view for scalability? I don't know why, but... <laughs> I think uh, multi-line is uh, scalable. Yeah, multi-line is more scalable, uh, we can expand more and more and more. Yeah, and the other one? Uh, we, we need to uh, yeah, add more parts. Uh, yeah, need more cables. So I think multi-line is more uh, affordable. Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah, more affordable. This is add more machines. In fact, most local area networks that use cables and things like that, they devices. With this one here, first, it's going to be very expensive if you have 100 machines, you want to connect them. You know how many cables do you need? Anybody has any idea how many cables, bits of cables required to connect? For each uh, for one hundred machines, what do so you think? One thousand. Remember this machine here. There are five here. See, one connects it to that. Two, three, four, and then if you look at this five, six, seven, eight, something. Like so it's a uh, n into n minus one. N into n minus. Okay, there's a formula for finding out yeah, those, and it's n times n minus. One. N times N minus one divided by two. I'll, I'll write the formula later, or you'll see it later. So if you had five, it's five times four divided by two. The number of devices multiplied by the number of devices minus one, N multiplied into N minus one divided by two. So in this case, for five machines, how many lengths of cables do we need? Can you work it out? Five times five minus one divided by two. Five times four divided by two, that's 20 divided by two, 10 cables, five machines, which is not bad. You know how many devices we need? 100 multiplied by 99, which is almost 10,000 divided by two, 10,000. In order to communicate with each and every machine, so the number is huge. It's very expensive. And also, you need, at the back of every computer, you need a port that you can plug it in. You're not going to get 100 ports at the back of every computer. You might get four, you might get six. So it's almost impossible to connect your network into point to point if it's more than four or five machines. Okay, so it's not scalable. That's in short, it's not scalable. What you, you need to know why is it not scalable? Because of the cost, and it's also because of, it's almost impossible to get one computer with all, each and every computer with all as many ports at the back of that computer. Yeah. Divided by two is the number of link, the number of cable links that's required in a, this kind of a network or this kind of connectivities. 
Right, maintenance. Which one is easy to maintain? Okay, this is depending on the size, maybe. Yeah, anybody has any ideas? Yeah? And, uh, <coughs> and the multiple one we can one goes down, the other will start working. So we can use the okay, that's the oh. you're talking about robustness. No. So my point is when it comes to maintenance, we need to keep one of the machines out there and the others are working. Okay, to recover, to, to get the others so working. Let people, let other guys no maintenance. I mean, if for example I say add one more machine. I don't know if they have here. So let's say we, we said, hey, we want to add one more machine. Which one would be easier to do? It? On the multi-link or point to point? Both. On the multi-link. Well, this one here. Okay. I might have to cut this wire, connect, repair another device, another machine, and so on. And before you fit it, you have to cut this wire. Any problems when you cut that wire? All oh. communication stops on the network. So that's the kind of thing that can happen, you know, if, if you work on a network in place and you say, the moment you start disconnected, when you say, ah, the network is down, okay. it's not really a great thing. Maybe it's easy to do, but the effect of it is on, the, on everyone. If you want to add a device here, that the device, you have five or 10 or whatever, more cables, 10 or 20, connect them to the device, and go back and start connecting to the back of each one of them. Apart from the, the bundle of cables that you have to deal with, it's, it doesn't, nobody even knows in the network. Nobody knows you're installing or removing a cable or a device. Here, even for, if you are removing a device, the moment you disconnect it, you actually broke that circuit and all communication stops. So if you decide, okay, guys, I'm going to take my computer and go to the other office, disconnect. Yeah. On this one. So this one, maintenance wise, may not be good because any work you do almost will cause the network to go down, which is not great. Especially in big networks, if you every day you get four or five reports of hey my machine isn't working, can you replace it? So you replace it and everybody you know stops working. They say, okay, let's go for a break. And then it takes you 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half an hour to fix it. And then <laughs> half an hour later, they call you for another problem. So it's really bad for users, maintenance wise. Right. What about fault isolation? Yeah. Yeah, it is, yeah, robust, yes, yeah. I feel like if you update it, then the point to point is better, but it takes a lot of labor to coordinate the different computers. They're both, yeah, I'm not going to see this separately. That's why you need to know. Good company, and you tell them, no, that's very expensive. Actually, you don't care about money. Oh, that's good. And so then you say, oh. Um, you know, you need a lot of connections behind it. You don't grow big. You don't want to grow big. You only have six, five machines, that's it. And then, yeah, you go from point to point. So you have to consider all the options that are there. Um, single point of failure. As you mentioned that, this one had a single point of failure. That cable, if it just gets disconnected, everybody, all the network stops. And that's why maintenance is a little bit difficult with that. With this one, there's no single point failure. Any cable that breaks, it will continue to work. Link utilization. Which one will use those links more to their maximum capacity or close to maximum capacity? If you're using the dedicated link, or the, if you're using the point to point or multi point? What is it? Yeah. 
No, the dedicated the capacity is there. If you, are, if you are connected, for example, your machine is number one at the top there. Yeah, you're, you're connected to this machine. You are, this is your machine and you're connected to the other four. So you have dedicated link of this, of all those four cables. You're gonna be transferring a five to one of them. The other three are not being used. So really you're not utilizing it. With the shared link, always shared links have higher capacity um, utilization. So if this link, yeah. And those two are exchanged. And the moment they stop, the other one is there. And they're probably all waiting in a queue. So the, the total capacity is limited, but it's high, it's better shared. Because there are more users, because it's it's there are a lot more users. Which one is more secure? The good answer. It's the wrong answer. <clears throat> Trying to fight or multi point, which one is more secure? Anybody? Yeah, at the back. Anybody wants? To, let me see some hands going up. Raise your hands going up. If you can, that's a good answer. Which one is more secure than the other? They're both secure. Maybe you should say both equally secure, which means both of them are not secure. No communication is secure, guys. Networks don't provide you any security. If you want secure communication, you will have to take your own security precautions at both ends, right? So neither, no network is secure in general. You'll see some of them are slightly more secure than others, but not because of you know the, the way they're connected, because maybe the channels themselves. We'll see later on the slight difference. But uh, in general, the moment the information leaves your device, the moment it leaves your computer, if it's important, or if you were, if you were important, then be certain there are those who, who might be after that information and if they can get it so easy. It'll leave, it'll go out, out of Griffith College and there's one post, one line that everything leaves on. And somebody can pick that information so easily. <clears throat> we'll see later on, we'll talk about media after this. So you'll see how information can be um, picked up. <clears throat> then latency, it's delay. Some latency has a couple of, you know, two ways of de de definitions, two definitions. Latency, in networks in general, they say, how long does it take for a signal to be transferred from one end to the other end? That's called latency. But also here, we mean at the start, you wanna start transferring the amount of delay that you can get before you can actually start transmitting. From the moment your user says, send this message to the moment that it actually starts transmission. So it, just be careful with this definition, but, now we're talking about a delay at the start. Which one of these here is more likely to suffer from a delay at the start when we say send this message? The multi-pointer or the point-to-point? Line is shared and if, for example, user A here, the user hits a message and says send, and your transmitter is going to start sending it down. But C is already transmitting, so it has to wait for it. And maybe D is also waiting, and there's a queue. So you wait before they can send until they send their packets, and then your turn will come up. But it take a little while. So they might be more likely to have a delay with the dedicated links because these are dedicated links. There is no delay in the dedicated link. So at least, you know, you, you can use as much of the link as you can. You know, that the full capacity is used, but here the full capacity is not used. You only get a percentage of that capacity depending on how many machines are connected. And the more machines, the more users use that multi-link, the more delay you're gonna have. <coughs> Sorry, can I yeah. because 
Did we say so anything about cold isolation? Did we say cold isolation? Cold isolation did we say? Cold isolation. Yeah, no, we didn't. But do you want to tell us something about it? No, that was <laughs> okay. Thank you for our notes in that. I, I intentionally meant it and skipped it to say that if, if somebody is what is following us or not. Thank you. All right. Who is gonna tell me fault isolation? Which one is better? First, what do you mean by fault isolation? If something goes wrong, you go straight and say, ah, here's the problem, and you fix it. That's isolating the fault. That means finding out the fault very quickly. Which one is quicker in this case than isolating the fault in your view? Right. Multi-point or, or point to point? I think point to point because every that is if some wire has a problem, we can just fix it and we can cover it. But no, okay, we, we're not talking about fixing, but how do you know which wire has the problem? Because uh, it's special for some transmission that we can understand. Okay, how do you know the problem is here? How do you so, find let's it? say location three tries to communicate with location two, and if there is a problem, we know which fuse must be used yeah. to this wire. Okay, so this is correct. In in this system, in the multi-point, if you get the loose connection here or there, at like this T connector or at the back of a computer, the, the whole electric circuit is open and everybody stops communicating. So, if the, if the link breaks, if you can see it's actually broken, oh, that would be easy. You know, they spot it and fix it. But most of the time, what happens? The link is connected to a T connector, but it's a little bit loose. It pulls out a little bit. It's not touching. It's not making contact, but it's still, you know, physically contact, you know, connected. So in that case, it's very difficult to find out because everybody's while here. This number three says to you, I can communicate with everyone except with number two. Number two says I can communicate with everyone except with number three. And you know the problem <laughs> is limited in this area. That's what we mean by fault isolation. How quick can you uh, isolate the problem? So in this here, a <clears throat> hundred computers connected in a multi-point, and every computer has a connection at its back that can go wrong. A T connector here that can go wrong. So two connections. You can have 200 connections. And even that T connector, like we have three connections, one on either side. And in fact, you're going to check five connections for each device. That's 500 connections. It's going to take you a long time to the point that they've actually developing a technique or algorithm to find out where the fault is very quickly. What they say, they say, you disconnect the network into two halves. So you have the same network, but half of it, and see if that works. If this works, I mean, everything is fine here, the connection, the back connection is here, the problem is here. Then you come down here and you split it in half, and that's binary kind of splitting the network into halves until you isolate the, this is the quickest way of finding out where that fault is, other than finding it by accident or, but yeah, that's fault isolation. So, but keep that in mind, it doesn't just go for those connectivity, but also for topologies. Any, any time we have connections, this nature or this nature, they, have, they almost have the same advantages and disadvantages, same problems and same uh, features. Okay, and generally that's how communication happens. That's what it looks like. The world looks like this. Lots of smaller networks, we call them local area networks, and they're connected by routers. Like a local area network, like in college here, it can be connected to other local area networks, neighbors through a router, and this whole world is full of networks, networks, but they are interconnected by these devices that we call routers. And usually users, if we are to draw users here, they'd be here, users connected to these networks here. 
And one user on this network might want to communicate with another user on this network. So it might go this way. And, you know, and we've done switching. So you saw that each router can look where's the, my neighbor. So the information moves from one router to the next, not from one network to the next. So a user here will send the information to this router. This router will send the information to this router or that router. And if it's this one, then this one will find out this router. And then this router will send it to this router. And it will deliver the information to its neighboring user. So this is the overall picture around the world. So anytime you know there's communication and all it's moving from one device to this router, and you need to have at least one router neighbor, maybe two, maybe three, and here has four routers that connects you to other networks. And that's what the world from here to Australia, if you send a message, you'll be going from one router to the next, from one router to the next through neighboring network. For example, you're going to send a message here, go from this to that network. <coughs> Even though, remember, it doesn't stay at the network, it goes from this router to that router. But you say, okay, go to this network, that network, that network, and then to the user. And these are like airports. Like when we talked about, we talked about virtual circuit, when you book a holiday, but on, on virtual circuit communication, as we'll see later, that if you want to send a message from a user here to a user there, it might go from to the airport and then the airport even. Turkey and Istanbul is here, and you're here in Ireland, you can go to through London, you can go through Rome, whatever it is. So you pick whichever one that brings you to the next location, and you take one, like routers, consider them like airports if you are physically traveling. You said the, this interlocking happens between the countries, right? Yeah. So is there a possibility of latency when we when I talk about sending a message from Dublin to Australia? Yeah, there is there is, of course there is. But messages travel at certain speeds. Either they travel in wires, and in wires they travel at speed of anybody knows how fast they travel? In wires they travel at two thirds the speed of light. You are sending it in fiber optic cables with the speed of light. So I don't know how fast the speed of light is, but about about twenty or eighty thousand. No, no, about four hundred thousand kilometers per second or something around there. So I'm just making it up now, but it's close to that. Um, because we said radio signals are also very close to the speed of light and they travel to a satellite and back in quarter of a second, or 35,000 kilometers, about 70,000 kilometers in a quarter of a second, by before, but yeah, about 300,000 um, kilometers per second. Yeah, so they, they get there in quarter of a second or less to Australia. You know, the circum circumference of the Earth is 24,000 kilometers. Uh, it's actually, if we had a fiber optic cable trouble in less than one tenth of a second. So it's, it's not that far. The, the, there is a delay, but it's very, very little. And it's getting faster. Networks, of course, the delay is gonna happen because when you send your packet from here, it might have, it gets delayed at this router, waiting for it to be transmitted to this router or this router, for example. So well, that's where the delay is going to happen. But once transmission happens, it's fast enough. But usually, some of you know some of these routers they, they actually can transmit one million packets per second. So that's reasonably fast. But still, sometimes you get a lot of traffic, and that can cause delay. And that's probably what the world, the surface of, of Earth, might you know there'd be lots of networks on it around it this way. And your message would be traveling through these routers from one network, from one router to the next, and from one network to the next. So let's get down to message switching. Like when we started switching techniques, I, I mentioned message switching. This is the old way how computers started communicating. By just having a transmitter on one device here, transmitted to the next device, which can be a hundred kilometers away or a thousand kilometers away. 
but the full message, if you are asked to describe message switching, you just take the full message and transfer it all the way to the next machine and save it on a tape because it's too big to fit in memory, in main memory. So we put it on external storage devices. It keeps going, transmitted from one machine to the next. And when it's fully received in each machine, only then you send it to the next one. And you keep doing it until eventually it gets to the final destination. This is, what's the problem with this technique? We've already talked about this. Anybody has, can tell me one disadvantage of this technique? Yeah. I give you hints. How about we start? Speed. Fast. Why? Low because you need to transfer the message and it doesn't go in memory of the router. It has to be written or saved or copied onto the tape an external storage device. And that's the slow part. So if, if the file is large, it could take you 10 minutes or even half an hour to transmit a file and send it to this station. Once you finish, then you disconnect that transmitter and start from to the next one and you do it. So this most of it is done manually. It's a slow operation. This is known as message switching. This is an old technique. It's no longer in use. And this can take hours to send a message from one end all the way to the other end. It can take hours. So they improve this technique by using what's known as the datagram switching technique. So they say this message, you should never send a full message. You must break it into smaller packets. They call them packets or they call them datagrams. Or depending on the networks, they have different names. Some names, they, some networks call them cells a cell of communication. So, but we we'll use the word packet is more general now, or datagram. And that's the name of this method, datagram. So in, you take the message, this is how datagram, this is how you describe it. If you are asked to describe, describe datagram switching technique. You say the sender takes the message and breaks it into smaller packets. Every packet, we add a header to it. The moment you say add headers, that's extra weight you need to carry. That's redundant data. And every header will have the sequence numbers. They are numbers, one, two, three. Three, they start from zero. Zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. And why do we give the, put, them, put sequence numbers onto them? Get the sequence and the transmission. So if the receiver receives them and one is missing or they are out of order, they can be put in order. Or if one is lost, at least, you know, in some networks, they can tell you which one is lost. So it's, we need to identify these packets. Between, at least between sender and receiver, they need to identify them. Between every two routers, they need to be identified. Okay, so, so far I've made a few statements. And usually I, when I ask this question, I say describe data graph switching technique sometimes, and if there are 10 marks on the question, that means I'm expecting 10 statements, one mark per statement, right? So I just said, the sender will take packets, the message, break it into packets, small size packets, that's one statement. We add a header to each packet, maybe another statement. Every packet will add the sequence number onto that packet. And then what else do we add to the packet? Any idea? Source and destination addresses. Usually these are IP addresses on the IP in, in, in the internet networks or, but there are other networks and they may not use the IP address, but they use some other identifier. But we'll now, for now we say source address and destination address. So on the header, there's more you know, information done in there. There's more information to go, but we we'll leave it now at this. That's the minimum we need now. And then, the sender just gives the packets to the network, to the router it's con that connects it to the network. So if you have a network at home, you're connected to a router. Sometimes they call it gateway, sometimes they, whatever name they call it, that's your connection to the internet. So you just send it those packets. 
You don't ask, you don't request. You just give the packet and the router will deal with them. And that's how to deal with them. Each packet is checked. Where's the best way to send you? This way, this way, this way. The next packet, it might go in a different direction. So packets may change direction, may not. You know, if you're asked, do they always go in a different direction? No, sometimes they'll always follow the same for each message, for the same message from the same sender to the same receiver. And when the receiver receives all these packets, check them for sequence, correct them, and get rid of all the packets that were added by that sender. Well, that's why this is redundant data. It's only needed during transmission once the packet is received by the final machine, they're removed and put together, you probably be writing it, writing that file onto your hard disk. It's like when you download a file or music or video, you'll be receiving packets and you'll write, open a file on your hard disk and start writing until you finish. Yeah. So in this case, the, the sequence, right? Who exactly performed this task to put it back? So sender sends some information. The receiving machine. In Is that router or the... Pardon? Is that a router or the, or the machine or the computer? No, the, the computer. Uh, the, the, uh, there's software that the network will put onto your computer. Anytime you join a network, they'll put a bit of software onto your the final machine. Kind of player. Pardon? Like kind of video player, you could say. Um, YouTube. Yeah, it could be any, no, even before that, there's a, there's a software that belongs to the network that's, that's talking to this software on this machine. So we'll, we'll later on, we we'll, 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 we'll do this part of the communication that every computer in order to communicate, you need to put a software that allows it to communicate with the other side based on certain rules and protocols. So that you will, this machine must have a small part of that network application and this one. Computers have their own applications as well. But routers do not check. They do not check. They do not. Even with this one, we'll see later on that it was an extra addition to, to put them together. It, the original internet protocol, it never checks whether they are in sequence or out of sequence, or you know, they have errors or no, have no errors. They don't care. You know, that's the way datagram switching technique is built originally. It doesn't provide any error detection or any acknowledgement. So when this sender A sends a message to user B, it doesn't know whether user B got it or did not get it. Unless if user B, you can add like YouTube or down any other application, then now the application will send back to the other and say, okay, thank you, we got the file. Now you know it's, it's good. But it's not the network that does that. It's not part of the network job. All right, so that's the datagram. Another run of the datagram switching technique. Again, we break the packet, but the packets sometimes they go in different routes altogether. Some of them can get lost a little bit. Some of them never get there, but sometimes they get out of sequence. You hear the one, three, two, four, instead of one, two, three, four. Okay, some of the keywords here, shared. Are the links shared or dedicated in this technique? Any idea? Share. Is that better than dedicated links? If you are dedicated, or is it worse? What do you think? Is shared links better or dedicated links better? You tell us. Yeah, I think you're right. It depends. Right? And then you take it from there. Shared lines will give you. Bad quality of service because you have sharing the line. Dedicated will give you better, faster service because you have the whole line to yourself. But dedicated lines are more expensive. So keep that in mind all the time. But datagram is definitely shared. And is there a limit on how many users can use the datagram? Is there a limitation on the number of users in datagram? There is no limitation because any user can take data, break it into packets, and give it to the network. The, net, the network must must never say no. The network cannot say no. Right, let's go to the next one. 
Now, this is some of the information that this is going to be on Moodle, or this is already on Moodle. This, so these are the statements <coughs> that describe datagram switching technique. How it starts maybe, and then some advantages and disadvantages. And datagram switching technique is like the postal system. You send a letter, goes all the way to Australia. It might be dumped or lost halfway through. You don't know. The sender does not know whether the letter was delivered or not. And it can go from, you send a letter today from London to Rome. It might go straight to Rome. Tomorrow, same letter to the same address from the same sender. It might go through Paris to Rome. The next day, it might go Madrid to Rome. It might go in different directions. I'd get there. So that's how datagram switching technique works. Well, let's get back. This is some of its advantages. It's more robust because if one link breaks, packets will go in different direction. The routers, each router, the point, maybe that's something, another statement to make, or you should know is that every router looks at every single individual packet and finds out where's the best way to send it. It has a table for this address, go this way. Maybe it has the whole world, one side, side, one side, the other, say, okay, go to line one or line two. It doesn't know the route to every part in the world, every other location in the world. It just connects it to four or five others. And it says, okay, if you're going north or going to Europe, go to route or maybe somewhere else. If you're local, go to this route. So every router has four or five routers connected to it. And that's what we mean by thick picking up the route. It, it's a very quick operation. It's not really, it's not called routing, it's called packet forwarding. You get the packet, you open it, you look, where do you want to go? And check the list and the list will tell you, open oh, port three, send it this way or that way. And do the next one, next one, next one, so fast. This process itself is very, very fast. We can forward a million packets a second. Now let's, we looked at the other one, circuit switching. I'm gonna leave circuit switching. I go straight into virtual circuits. This is how virtual circuits work. Virtual circuit, like establishing a circuit, but the word virtual means it's not a real circuit. It's, it's like re a circuit, just like virtual reality and so many other virtuality. But um, this is the way it works. Before, in virtual circuits and in circuit, before you send data, and this is different from datagram. In datagram, you want to send data, great. Break it into packets and send it. Nobody will say no to you. With this one, you can't just break the packet data and send it. You must first send a request to, in order to set up a call. So the request goes with source address, destination addresses, and you send it. And every router will look at that packet and say, all right, okay, maybe the best route to go this way. No, I'll send you this way. And then this one might say, I'll send you that way. And this one, the, the other router might say, no, I can't take you. Then we try another router until eventually we find a route that connects us to the final destination. Now the receiver here will also have to respond with yes or no, accept the call or refuse the call, deny the call. If they accept it or deny it, a message will travel back, a packet will travel back to say, yes, I'll accept the call or no, I'm denying the call. And if it's denying the call, then the whole thing is forgotten and the, this plan is, is gone. Now, the router will keep this information, every router will keep information in a table called virtual circuits table in its memory of A is communicating with B and this one came on link number zero. For example, this link is zero, one, two, three. It comes from zero and I'll forward it to two. And if the call is accepted, this router will send to this user, your call is accepted and it will give it a number. This is like when you book a flight. If you book your holiday, you go from Dublin, you book a flight all the way to Istanbul. You decide, I go to London. You book an Aer Lingus, you book flight to Aer Lingus and then from Aer Lingus from Dublin to London, from London to Paris, you book another flight on British Airways and from Paris to Rome, you book another flight, then Rome to Istanbul. So you make a number of bookings, but each time you book, they give you a code number. It's called, they call it in airlines, the booking code. And they take all your information. Same with this call. A is gonna talk to B, each router here, 
took that details. A is communicating with B and it knows which link. It came on this link and sleeping on this link or vice versa. Same with this one. It knows which link is coming. These links are like the gates at the airport, which gate you're going to use to bring it to the next airport. Same here, which, which gate you're going to take. They call them here ports or connections or links, which link you're going to take to the next router. So this information is written in the table. So the next time, okay, once this is all accepted, a virtual circuit number is given to A, the accept packet will come back using the same route. And now the user here will open the packets, break the, uh, the message, break it into packets, put sequence number onto them and put that booking code, or we call it here, the virtual circuit number. And every router will know about this call. And they, all the packets will follow exactly the same route. So here, most likely, the packets will arrive in the correct sequence, unless something really badly goes wrong. Then anybody can send a call clear. And when the call is clear, then every router will wipe off its memory, the details of this call. Oh, maybe another one can take it. Another one can take place, another call. So this is called virtual second. Okay, so it might be asked about sharing. Are these links shared or dedicated? Yeah, I've watched so many times. Dedicated, yeah, very good. Are they dedicated, those things? They're shared. But there's a difference in sharing, like the, the previous one, the datagram switching technique. What's the difference between sharing in datagram and sharing now in virtual circuit? Any differences? Yeah. Uh, in datagram might be in virtual circuits, might, you might get blocked. So if, yeah. you, if there is more user than your limit. Uh, okay. All right, you answered the question in a different way. But yeah, the sharing in virtual circuits is limits. And the data gram is under. So now here, you might, you might allow, this router might only allow 5,000 calls. Another call after that will say, no, I'll block that call. Or it might allow 1,000 calls. If this router has little memory and not so fast, probably decide I want to take 1,000 calls. If it gets 1,001 call, it'll block it. So now you can get blocked using this technique. If you want to make a call, that's why you have to send a request first. And the request might, you get the response, no, denial. So it's possible to be denied. You might be denied by the final destination. Like somebody just sends a request, why get denied by this router, not you could be denied by the final receiver, but it could be this one. Get the call, say, great, I'll send it to this one. This one says, no, I can't handle it. Denied. So this one says, all right, can you handle it? Might say, no, I might send it to this one. So the route has been try and find a good route. It's try and find out the, the fastest route for you, but also a route that's accepted by every router. And finally, accepted by the final receiver. And once that route is established, it's like the circuit switching, like the telephone. You'll, all your packets will follow, must follow this route. They cannot deviate. And if this route breaks for some reason, if a link along this route breaks or a router goes down, let's imagine now if we, have already, we are sending packets this way, we cannot send them in any other way in the virtual circuit. What happens if this, no, if this router breaks, goes down, and we go to this router and we go around, not in virtual circuits. There's no flexibility in the route. At the start, it's flexible. You pick the best route. But once the route is established, you cannot change it. If something goes wrong, it's not, it's not um, flexible in routing. It's not robust. If that link breaks, your, your call is terminated. What about quality of service? I have the arrows going up. That means, yes, we, it's available. Down, that means it's a bad thing. So it's two disadvantages, as you can see here. Flexible routing is a problem in this kind of technology. That means routes are not flexible. And robustness, it's not robust. Because they are, I have the arrows going down. Just that's my way of saying it's bad. If the arrows are going up, that means, yes, we have this good thing, whatever it is. 
So share. Okay, I'm saying it's good. Share. Is it good point to share links? I keep asking this question. I have it as an advantage. I think we have it. In this or in any connectivity, is it good to share lines? Is it better to share lines? Yes, it depends. Yeah. <laughs> right, give me one, one reason why it's a good idea to share lines. Guys, cheaper cost. You have 10,000 people sharing a line. The cost is cheaper than if that line is only yours. You have to pay for it. You know how much at least line cost in, in uh, most countries? They cost about 150,000 euros. If you want your own private dedicated telephone line, you can apply to the post office. They, they'd give it to you, no problem. They charge you 150,000 pounds. It's for some companies, it's worth it. But you know, for normal users, no, it's not worth it. Right, okay, so this is the virtual circuit switching technique. So ultimately now, I'll just go back to virtual circuits and data modeling. Which one is better? We just looked at both of them. It depends on what you say. Excellent answer. Right, give me one reason why data ground is better than virtual circuits. It's cheaper. Another reason why it's better or worse. No what? <laughs> I can't hear, but yeah, I think you're right. On your, on... In datagram, you're not sure if the in datagram there is no acknowledgement and there's no error detection. You might consider is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? We don't have acknowledgement. It's a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. A good answer, but it's not the right answer. It depends. Sometimes you don't want to be acknowledged. You don't want acknowledgement. So, you know, it depends. Give me one example where you don't really need acknowledgement or you don't want acknowledgement for delivered messages. Anybody has, can think of any reason why we don't need acknowledgement? Yeah? In advertising. In advertising, in general, you can send millions and billions of messages. Let them go. Yeah, you're, you don't really care if they all got there or didn't. You know, the majority will get there. And people don't like it, but they get it anyway. So, all right. So be careful. Just be a little bit more precise with your choices. Okay, so these are the statements that describe virtual circuits and data drum. And we talk about packet sizes as well. So, right, I'll just ask the question. We've already talked about this. Which one is better if now if you want to break your message into packets? Do you send large packets? Do you break it into large packets or small packets? Which one is better? Oh, who, who am I going to talk? Right. Yeah, any ideas? Larger packets are better, right? Yeah. Yeah, good, good answers, but it's not the right answer. Hold on, answer. Okay, what do you think? What do you think, guys? Yeah? You have to make use of the right use language. Use the line in front of person. Okay, so if you want to use something, I don't know. No, I don't think line utilization go into it. Yeah. The smaller the packets, the faster they'll travel for, for a couple of reasons. But then why don't we just use very small packets? The smaller the pack, the better the package. Yeah? That's headers. That's headers. If you if you take your message and break it into a million packets. But every packet will have a header. Now you have a million headers. And a million headers means you have a million redundant pieces of information that you need to tell. That will take some of the capacity of that link that you intend to do. So 
Smaller packets are better, but if you go too small, you're gonna to have too many headers and they're gonna start becoming disadvantaged again. And why are smaller packets are better? You know, generally, because here's a quick example. If you take a message and send it all in one packet, is that means remember something else. If you start transmitting a packet, one packet from one router to the next, and this router starts receiving the packet, it has received quarter, one third, one half of the packet. It cannot start sending it to the next router until it fully receives that packet first. That means every packet must be fully received and then the router will start sending it to the next one until it's fully received. Now, if you only, if you put all your message into one very large packet, then only this router will start working. And for example, it takes two seconds to transfer the whole message. Then it'll take two seconds, four seconds, six seconds to reach four routers, router number four. But if you break it into two halves, the packet, then the first router will send half the packet, which take only one second. Now in the next second, it will send the second packet, but the next router will be sending that first packet that it received. So now you have two routers working in your message. And after a little while, you'll have, you know, two other routers. So at any given time, two routers are transmitting simultaneously on your message, different parts of your message. So, and that actually tends to get there faster. So you see this, the length of time it took here six, it only took about four seconds here. Now, if we break this into even more smaller ones, now you're gonna start having the problem with the headers. It's not gonna get any faster, it starts getting slower again. Because, you know, you're gonna get more and more headers and that takes, well, in this case, yeah, it went a little bit slower, fast, faster, took less time, but then when we broke it even into more smaller packets, it started going, taking a longer time. So be careful with that answer. In general, this is in general, smaller packets are faster. And also they are faster if in the case of errors. See this packet here, if after delivering it two seconds, when this one got it said, ah, oh, there is one bit error, then you have to send it again. It takes another two seconds just to transmit it. But that smaller packets, they'll take a lot less time to retransmit in the case of errors. But just we know Dictogram doesn't have error detection now from one point to the next, but yeah, other networks do have error detection. And sometimes the, the error is detected from one end to the other. When the last receiver gets the message and say there's an error, it's gonna take a long time to retransmit the large packet. But if it was one of those small ones that developed the error, it will be a lot easier to transmit it. Okay, so. You can see those and go through those questions. Did I give you that practice or I'll put the practice on, on Moodle. So have a look at those questions and answer them. You don't have to send them to me. I'll put them on Moodle just for your own practice. And I'll put the correct solutions afterward. All right, we're gonna start another topic. <clears throat>